Welcome to Let's Talk About Life, a podcast brought to you by LifeBank, the organ, eye, and tissue recovery agency in Northeast Ohio. Donation can be a complicated subject, but it is really all about life. So spend a few minutes as we unravel the complexities of donation. So come on, let's talk about life. When our kids are little, we tend to keep them close and try to keep them out of harm's way. It's our job to teach them how to look both ways before crossing the street, stranger danger, and learning their home address and phone number should they ever get lost. Our circle of protection only goes so far though, and for so long. Before we know it, we're sending them out on the road as new drivers, then in a blink of an eye, off to college for many. As every parent, guardian, or concerned auntie knows, we must let go of their hand and send them off into the world. Hi, you're listening to episode 102 of Let's Talk About Life. I'm your host, Colleen Gerber, kidney recipient and LifeBank staff member. We are quickly approaching Father's Day, and we are really honored to have a very special guest joining the podcast. Don Corpora is the Chief of HR Services for the Cleveland Clinic and currently serves as a treasurer on the LifeBank Board of Directors. Additionally, Don has a very special connection to the mission of organ donation, which he will share in a bit. Don, thanks so much for joining our podcast. It's an honor. That's my pleasure to be here today. I'm going to begin with your professional life. I mentioned you work for the Cleveland Clinic. Can you tell me a little about your career? Sure. I've been fortunate to be able to spend uh, the last 32 years in Northeast Ohio, really with the Cleveland Clinic and its affiliate hospitals. And it's really been a blessing for me. I'm not somebody that's, that feels like I was destined to take care of patients, but always wanted to work in hospital administration and found a niche in being that person that uh, helps support our caregivers. That's how we refer to our 65,000 domestic employees and 72,000 global employees uh, for the Cleveland Clinic. They are caregivers. We are all caregivers, and we take that uh, seriously as part of our mission. And so it's really been a mission that uh, I feel like I've been able to embrace and, uh, like I said, sort of found my niche in finding ways to take care of them. So a lot of the scope of my responsibility has to do with uh, developing and creating policy, working with our total rewards teams on compensation and benefits, and uh, working closely with our talent acquisition partners to ensure that we can uh, find the best caregivers uh, for our patients. And it's been, it's been uh, challenging over the last couple of years, to say the least, as all hospitals uh, and other industries have, have experienced. I can only imagine with uh, this pandemic, it seemed like the whole world changed on a dime. One of the things as a Cleveland Clinic patient, I would say I appreciated so much was when video appointments were made available. As somebody who is immunosuppressed, it really helped me navigate that pandemic and feel safe to be able to get the information I needed from my care team, but yet remain safe. So I'm loving you guys in the last couple of years. You made my life so much easier. I think in the workplace, uh, especially, that's, those are two uh, extraordinary challenges that many employers were able to overcome in healthcare organizations, and that is transitioning to the virtual visit, especially for a generation that may not have grown up entirely with technology, especially the technology of today compared to technology even five years ago or 10 years ago. And if you would have told me that, you know, literally overnight that we could accommodate 800 or so caregivers that provide uh, support services and can work remotely virtually overnight, that's been gratifying to be able to see that happen. And now, you know, being able to see many of them come back into the workplace and redevelop those relationships, I think is important. Absolutely. Again, I feel like the Cleveland Clinic is one of the best transplant programs in the country. On the other side of that, you are also a donor hospital. How does that add to your fulfillment of your job and knowing that you're not only saving the life of people with disease, but through transplantation and donation as well? I'm glad you asked me that question because I think that that's part of the story that isn't as widely communicated as uh, the stories around the transplant recipients and what they receive. And when you're a donor hospital, 
I think that at least, uh, you know, as far as my own personal experience and experience in talking with other uh, donor families, and it's really how you approach them and how thoughtful you are in that process and understanding that it's not a moment in time's decision, but it's really understanding the donation process, what's involved, and having somebody literally and figuratively hold your hand along the way. And that's, you know, one of the things that connects me to LifeBank. Um, it's an organization that is so thoughtful about the process, not just about the outcomes, but about the process. Yeah, that's one thing I'm most proud about LifeBank is that we're with families uh, at the beginning and then for months and even years later. So we are thoughtful about that. You mentioned you're a donor family member, and I'm hoping that you would share a little bit about your daughter, Leah, and her story. Certainly, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Leah became a donor in, uh, in 2019, in September of 2019. So I guess it doesn't matter how much time has passed. It's still something that you, you know, that you think about and you want to remember fondly. And uh, I think one of the things that we do is, uh, as donor parents, both my wife and I, is that we, we try to remain connected to the friends that she was close to and the family that she was close to. And they help us to really, you know, keep her memory alive and, you know, keep her spirit alive in our family. So that's an important thing. But Leah was, um, I guess, first and foremost, she would define herself as a Christian. And she was very committed to her faith. Uh, She loved God and she loved the Christian community. She was 22 years old when she passed and so far too young. But she had recently, in the events prior to her uh, tragic accident, She had graduated from Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, with a degree in information technology. She was on the gymnastics team for four years, so she had some close friends, and she graduated in May, and before she had graduated, she had committed herself to what she calls reinventing herself. Lisa is somewhat introverted, or has always been sort of introverted, and she defined friendship in a way that I don't know that I've heard other people define it. And what I mean by that is sometimes she would say to me, especially during her uh, uh, last few years, Dad, I don't have very many friends. And I would say, Leah, you seem to know everybody, you know. And it wasn't until after her passing that I really understood what that meant to her. Being a friend to Leah was meant that you were all in. And it was an unconditional love that, uh, that she had for the people that she called her friends that made her, you know, truly special and unique. And so I think, you know, that's something that really should be shared about her life because I think that that's, uh, that's important. So anyway, so she's made the commitment that she's going to move to New York City where she didn't know anybody and was going to get a job there. So trying to be supportive, we, we said, you know, certainly see if you can get a job. And she did. In a relatively short period of time, she got a job as a web developer for Avon, the cosmetics company, who's located near Wall Street in Manhattan. And so she pretty quickly got an apartment in Brooklyn and started working there and immediately kind of made friends. And she's always had really a very giving spirit. One of the funny stories I think about Leah was, was a story that uh, her best friend from college tells. And that was that she was doing a remote interview for a job, for an IT job. And one of the questions was, what can you bring to the team and her immediate response was, I can bake, or I can bake cookies, or something to that effect, <laughs> where <laughs> clearly that's not what they meant. I don't know that how well received that answer was, but that's how her spirit was, you know. Really, it was about what can I truly do for others around me. You know, as far as her commitment to organ donation, we felt pretty confident that that would have been her desire. And, you know, unfortunately, and uh, after she had been in New York for just a few months, uh, she was out with some friends uh, at a rooftop party in uh, in Brooklyn near her home. Uh, as the events of the night transpired, uh, she had she accidentally fell off the balcony about five stories up and uh, and she uh, lived for about two days afterwards. And then uh, and then she passed on September 9th. So. What a loss. What a loss. She was just starting to live her life. Yeah. And, the way, you know, the way that we look at it is that, and, you know, folks have said, you know, I don't know how you have the strength, you know, to go on. And, you know, both my wife and I truly believe that it's our faith that helps to sustain us and that, um, that God has a plan for all of us. 
and this was God's plan. I mean, you know, it was God's plan for her to to be an organ donor. It was God's plan for her to, you know, help save the lives of three other people. And, uh, and so we're grateful that she was able to do that. And, you know, what I tell people is that uh, I, I just feel like she got her work done here on earth before I did. Wow. What a wonderful way to look at it. Sometimes we, when you visualize life, you visualize living to 80 and 90 years old, but that's not always the case. Right. And it's not really how long you live. It's the impact you make. And um, wow, what an impact to save three lives. Not a lot of people can say that, really. But was she able to donate anything else beside organs? Was she also a tissue donor? She was. Uh, she was a tissue donor. She was able to donate her corneas and some bone. And then, uh, and then as far as the organs go, uh, uh, both kidneys, her liver, and her pancreas. My goodness. My goodness. What a girl. What yeah. a girl. Your two worlds are merging. You have this traumatic event happen with your family. And now you're here at LifeBank promoting the mission of organ, eye, and tissue donation as a board member. How does that help not only you personally, but your family heal from your loss? Thank you for asking me that question, because one of the things that that I want to make clear is that I was involved with LifeBank before Leah's tragedy and, you know, and her organ donation. So I was on the finance committee in 2016. And I try to join boards and organizations that I feel a connection to their mission. And so I can't tell you that, you know, I think that, that certainly God and, and fate had, uh, you know, a hand in, you know, finding my way to Life Bank in 2016. I was relocated from Akron to Beachwood, where my office is uh, with the Cleveland Clinic. And so really right around the corner, you know, from Life Bank, pretty close proximity. And, and uh, one of our uh, current board members, you know, suggested or had nominated me for you know, a position on the finance committee and which was not something that I had a lot of expertise. And so I always say that, you know, I'm the person that's always asking the most questions, mostly out of my, you know, out of ignorance, but I've learned a lot uh, over the last few years and feel like I can, uh, am able to be a contributor. So I really just joined the board in 2020 uh, as a board member. Do you feel different sitting on the board now with that personal experience? Do things impact you differently than before? Yes, there's no question about it, because as you mentioned earlier, or we talked about, and that is, I think about the process, and I think about how we do things, not just about, you know, the numbers and how many uh, organs we were able to transplant successfully, or you know, how many connections we were able to make, but it's really about how did we go about that process. So I feel like I have much more insight and much more interest in that part of what we do here. I can see that. Don, is there anything else you want to share? I don't know. I think you started to ask, and I don't know if I answered this question um, as thoroughly as, as I probably should have. But, you know, we talked about how uh, Leah was kind of living her best life when she got to New York. And it was really gratifying for us to see because she's not somebody that was um, overly confident you know, in her place in the world. And so one of the things that helps to give us, you know, peace as parents was, is knowing that your child is in, uh, is in a place, especially when they're not physically in your presence, but they're in a place, in a good place in their life. And so one of the things that uh, her friend and teammates had, uh, had sent to us was a text message that Leah had uh, just a few days uh, prior to her death. And uh, what she said was, um, a friend, I'm loving my life and I love my job and where I live and what I'm doing with my time and money. This is just such a very good time in my life. And even though it's not perfect, it's pretty dang close. And I always thought that that was, uh, that always gave us a lot of peace and, uh, in knowing that, you know, as you said earlier, you know, you try to prepare them for the world, your children, and you try to give them all the tools that they need to be successful, which is not just a college education or common sense or, you know, how to balance their checkbook and pay their bills. But it's really, uh, how do we know that they're in a place where they can, you know, be away from you and, and thrive. And so you look for the things that give you comfort, right? And, uh, and I think that those are, are, are some of those. Well, it sounds to me that she found her place in the world and that she was happy to be there. 
And I think that's not what we all strive to be and, and to get to that point. And she just got there a little bit earlier than you and I. <laughs> that's what we like to think. Wow. That's right. Well, Don, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and your service to Life Bank. I know I'm personally appreciative and especially for the Cleveland Clinic. You guys have done great by me the last 30 something years. So I appreciate all you do. And your contribution is priceless. I couldn't be happier to hear that. Thank you for having me and uh, not just allowing me to share my story, but really the, uh, the pride I feel in helping to support our caregivers at the Cleveland Clinic and, you know, promoting the work that we do in partnership with LifeBank. We hope you found today's episode informative and inspirational. You know, you can save lives simply by going to lifebanc.org and registering your donation decision. You can catch Let's Talk About Life on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, but you can always find it at lifebank.org. We thank you for listening and we hope you come back next time. And come on, let's talk about life. Thank you for listening to Let's Talk About Life. If you have questions about today's podcast, reach out to us at info at lifebank.org. Take a few minutes to do something heroic and register to be an organ donor by saying yes at lifebank.org. Literally, someone's life is depending on it.